All right, we are going to talk about the boiler. We are going to talk about steam generation and maybe expansion. I don't know yet. So we will start off with a drawing of the boiler and some general concepts. Now the boiler I work with is 4700 kpph, which means 4,700 thousand pounds per hour of steam generated. And this translates to about 720 megawatts. So you have to imagine that you have a steam drum you've got a drum on the top of your boiler and then coming off of that drum you have large pipes that come down to headers in the corners there's four of these we call them the downcomers because that's how the water goes down all the walls of the boiler are made of tubes. These tubes are about four inches in diameter. So when you fill the drum with water, let's, let's do that. You have to move it up there with a pump. Boiler feed pump. And before it goes into the drum, it goes to some tubes in the back pass. Then it comes out of the back pass and into the drum. That establishes your drum level. So the water that goes into the drum goes down the downcomers and then it gravity fills up through the tubes and makes its way back to the drum. Inside this giant box where all the walls are made of tubes, we have fire. You can have gas fired or oil fired or in my primary experience coal fired. All the principles are the same. So in this box of fire you get temperatures that are in the ballpark of 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat is absorbed into the walls. The walls are full of water. That makes bubbles steam bubbles make the water flow up into the drum and then the water mixes with the feed water coming in and goes back down the downcomer and repeats the cycle so you have about 10 times as much mass of water making a second lap as you do going out as steam Now we do not want wet steam going into our turbine. The reason we don't want that is because at the pressures and velocities that these turbines work at, the, uh, they're designed to have gas flow across the blades. Steam is the gas. They are not designed to have water which is 16,000 times denser than the gas impinging on the blades. It'd be almost like throwing pebbles into it. So how do we make sure that the steam is dry? This is a close up for those that think I'm an idiot. All right, so you have your feed water coming in and it goes into two sprinkler headers and then it gets channeled down into the downcomers. And then you have steam and water mixing in this region. 
one that comes back up from the walls. So you've got... Oh, that's way too big. I don't know what I'm doing with these tools. How about this one? So in this region, you end up with steam and water mixing. And what we want is for the water to make another lap and for the steam to go on to the turbine. And we use moisture separators. So all this steam and water gets channeled up to a cyclone moisture separator. And this forces it through this loop and that loop dumps the water back down and it lets the steam float out. Cyclone moisture separators. There's another kind of moisture separator which is at the very top and that is called a chevron moisture separator and that is just a thin little strips of metal close together making a little zigzag pattern. And this zigzag pattern, the steam will have no problem making it through these curves, but the water will hit this wall and it'll run back down. That should have been blue. And so the water portion will fall out on the walls and fall back down. So now we have dry, saturated steam coming out of the top of the drum. Dry, saturated steam coming out the top of the drum. So what the saturated mean saturated steam means that it is at the boiling point that if you take water that's at saturation and you heat it at all it turns into steam if you take steam that's at saturation and you cool it down at all it turns back into water so you have steam and water mixing equally and as you add energy it transitions from liquid to gas as you remove energy or cool it off which means the same thing because heat is energy then it will transition back from steam to water without changing temperature and for every given pressure there is a temperature at which saturation occurs and you make this transition back and forth all right, so you have your dry, saturated steam. Let's get back on red. And that makes up the roof of the boiler. So all the, all the walls were made of tubes. They had water and steam mixing going up. And then you come out, and now you have tubes that are just steam that make up the roof. And that has steam that makes it goes down the back wall and then more steam tubes that make up the walls of the back pass. So all that is steam and all the time because any place that you are boxing in this heat you want to capture it. You don't want to waste it, you don't want to let it blow out. So all these tubes are heating up the steam more and the steam becomes superheated. And that just means that you have raised it degrees above saturation temperature. So we have 1600 degree uh, fire and then you have the hot flue gas that is coming on and going across here. And so that hot flue gas is heating the economizer, which was a fancy name when it was new, but now it's just the final heater where the boiler feed pump is moving the water. So you're heating the water and then you are also heating other stuff. So after it makes up all these walls, you go into the first section of superheat. 
So you have a set of primary superheat tubes right here. And then that comes out of the boiler and goes up. And then you've got a secondary superheat. And these pendants hang down. And it's just a bunch of tubes that the flue gas has to travel across. Secondary superheat is also called radiant superheat because it receives radiant energy directly off the fire. You come out of the secondary superheat and you go down into the tertiary superheat and then you go down into the final superheat. And now you have your main steam header. And in our plant, the main steam header is 2500 PSI at 1050 degrees. What else do we have to talk about here? How do we control this 1050 degrees? That's a good question. So the boiler feed pump is pushing water up through a block valve and then upstream of that block valve on the ninth floor there we have a tap off and this goes up to the 15th floor and then you have another MOV and then an air operated control valve and then this sprays a temperation water into the steam between the primary superheat and the secondary superheat and that controls the temperature and what the logic is actually looking at is the outlet of the secondary superheat and trying to control it at 900 Fahrenheit and then you pick up more heat across the tertiary and more heat across the final and then you have another set of attemperation sprays another motorized block valve and two air operated control valves and they both go in spray in here between the tertiary and final superheat they both go to the same place but you've got separate controls for north and south because even though if you look at it, you'll swear that thing's the same from left to right. The heat's different inside. Any machine this big just picks up its quirks and there's nothing we can do about it as far as I can tell. And so this spray is what's actually looking at the main steam header on the final superheat to maintain 1050 Fahrenheit. What else can we add to the steam generator? There are relief valves. There's two spring operated relief valves and then two power operated relief valves controlled from the DCS. You have two motor operated vents on the drum. Those stay shut all the time you're actually running. So during startup, they are open until you get to 50 pounds. And then by that time, you've blown all the, the air out. And then they go shut and bottle it up. And you've got six more relief valves up here. What else do we have in the steam generator? I'm going to throw one more thing in here. I don't think you guys are ready, but I'm going to throw it in there anyway because I've come this far. So you got a check valve here. You've got manually operated isolation. And then you've got, let's pick another color.
I really need to get better at this. So then you've got another line that comes off the down comer and ties in right there. Now, if you look at this and you apply your logic of how stuff works, you know that the pressure on the feed pump has to be higher than the pressure on the drum or else the water would never go that way. And you say, well, water goes that way. Water would also go that way into the downcomer. So this is some way that we can skip that economizer zone and that is not what this is for at all. What this is for is during startup there are long periods of time when you have water in the drum and you're not adding any more water this guy is shut and since you are not adding any more water but you do have fire you do have steam you do need to keep these pipes cool and so you are in danger of the water in these pipes boiling off and then these pipes hitting unacceptable temperatures of 1200 plus degrees and blistering and damaging themselves. And then later when you try and put 3000 pounds of feed water on them, they will burst and you will spray water all over your back end and you'll have to shut down and cost millions of dollars to the owners. And we like saving the owners money so that they can share some of it with us. So to protect this economizer region during these times of no flow, we have a motor operated valve here for the economizer recirc and this is using natural circulation so as the water in the economizer section gets heated up it gets less dense expands less dense and it floats up to the drum and then the cooler water in the downcomer gravity pulls it down because cooler is more dense and pulls it down back to the inlet of the economizer and it will recirculate. Now when the feed pump is actually moving water up there, you're right, this does kind of bypass around the economizer, it short circuits the flow path, but that is not its intention. Its intention is to perfect, protect the economizer from overheating during no flow conditions.